All right, and it's happening. So uh, I would love to first check. Is Lauren, are you here? Hi. What's good? Where are you, by the way? I'm in East Harlem. Oh, good. I am in Super Southeast Harlem, also known as the Meatpacking oh. District. It's okay. Just like yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, it's like a hundred five mm -hmm. blocks south of you. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, let me just do a little roll call. We'll start. I wonder if I can control what you see. We have Duncan Stewart. Where are you, Duncan? I am in Lexington, Mass, outside nice. of Boston. All right. Well, very excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, condolences and good hugs and feelings to all the people up there. Uh, I lived in Boston 12 years, and it's extra sad, annoying, infuriating, frustrating, stupid, stupid dumb, crazy, weird, fartastic. Yes. Um, so thanks for uh, for being with us, Duncan. Let's go. And how did you hear about this? I'm curious. Uh, off Twitter. All right. You guys are on Twitter. One of those people. Okay. Next, uh, we have Gaga Gondwe. How you doing? Hi. First, did I pronounce your name uh, well? Yeah, no, that was right. Yes. <laughs> and where, um, where are you video calling? I'm at, um, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, actually. Nice, really? <laughs> Is yeah. this gonna be like an all Massachusetts <laughs> night? Let's, <laughs> let's see where this lands. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks again. We are like doubling down on Massachusetts. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and how'd you hear about this? Um, Twitter too. Twitter. Okay, another yeah. Twitter person. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, we're moving on to Jasmine Victor, or possibly Yasmin Victor. No, it's Jasmine. Jasmine. <laughs> Los Angeles. Los Angeles. I love the books in the background. You look very educated, important, yeah, and like intellectual. You. Yes. Was, it's all props. There's nothing actually. <laughs> all right, you could be a cable news host. You got yeah. the, the, the do, the glasses, the books. Yeah. This is great. A little whiteboard with mysterious calculations on it. Uh, those are actually my turkey. So I'm going to take the turkey out of the oven. So. Well, so we see if you don't make enough to share with everybody, that's just rude. That's just rude. I'm hungry. I gotta fly all the way to LA get some turkey. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Jasmine. Uh, Karen Saint Hilaire, how'd I do? Oh, we can't hear you. You might be muted. Okay, here I am. Hi guys. And where are you? Hey. What part of Massachusetts are you calling in from? Oh no, baby, <laughs> Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. <laughs> Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. All right, do or die. Nice. Uh, well, it's good to have you. How'd you hear about this? Twitter. Twitter. My goodness. All right. Uh, hey, it's our host Lauren from Harlem. You heard about this because I emailed you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> please be a part of this. In fact, what I want to do is uh, let me see if I still have that URL loaded locally. It was Guernica. Bam. Let me share my screen with y'all real quickly and explain why. Lauren is here because she wrote this piece that is so <laughs> dramatically badly timed. I said, this piece. There we go. She wrote this piece. And uh, can you guys actually see the text on that? The headline. Yeah, you can see the, the headline. The headline is the most important part. It says, how to be the black person reading how to be black, uh, which ran about a month ago. And I don't know if I should be reading that. <laughs> no, you're obligated to. Dude. That's how it works. You have to. In fact, if you don't read that article, you are so racist. It's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. So, let me just end this. All right. So um, Lauren and I did not prep in any formal capacity. We did some email and back and forth. But no. uh, I'm experimenting with Together. I thought I'd do some virtual event. I don't get to travel as many places as I'd like, even though I travel about half the time. And we even have people from New York, where I live and perform all the time, who are here on a virtual sense. We have people in Massachusetts, where I am present all the time. Um, and LA, where I'm also present uh, a lot of the times. Uh, if there's anyone who wants to check in and I didn't catch you, you can type into the, tax, the text chat area. And I just want to recognize you all a little bit and see like where you're dialing in from and how you, how you heard about this. So uh, but back to Lauren's presence here. I love this piece that she wrote. And I thought, OK, whoever wrote that. Gets it, 
and together suggested that I have some kind of moderator because I guess I can't be trusted. So <laughs> I thought, well, she put words together in an orderly fashion with proper grammar and punctuation. <laughs> maybe she can help facilitate this in some way, and maybe you had some questions uh, that you want to ask. I, I'm not going to do a formal presentation. That seems a little weird. This is a whole yeah. interactive medium, so we should all just yeah. interact. Um, and Lauren, I'll just hand it over uh, to you to just launch into some you know, questions. I'll also check the Together page and see if people had thrown questions in. I forgot to look back there. Um, and people right. will be able to type questions in the thing if you're feeling like you're not talking about the things I want you to talk about. Um, or we'll get you on video if you're already uh, in the channel. So end of monologue. Great. Go. All right. Um, well, just to jump right in, um, you're in your book, you have chapter titles that are, you know, how to be the black friend, how to be the black employee, how to be the angry Negro, um, and how to be the next black president. And I was wondering, which role do you think is most important to or has the most influence on bettering race relations? Ooh, wow. Okay, you're starting with the hard ones. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can well, save this for later. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Well done. Thanks for the toss-up. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. No need to apologize. I invited you in. I did not vet you clearly. You My people. This, yeah. I did. I did. I got to do better background checks. Um, no, so in terms of bettering race relations, I think the black friend one um, is a nice, soft... It's a it's a it's the most positive spin on race relations chapter, and I think in it I at least try to express a lot of sympathy for all the the players that I've identified, like the black person who is the friend of a group of non-black people, even the hater black person who judges them. I try to express some understanding of like why they do that visual prejudging, and, and especially for the non-black people to have them understand like what subconscious or passive burden they're putting on this extra friend and just have a little bit more respect for uh, the mm -hmm. dual or triple or quadruple role this person is asked to be uh, asking to, to play or having them play. I messed that sentence up, but you know what I'm saying? So I think in terms of bettering race relations, which you know it happens in some ways at a big policy macro level, but ultimately I think comes down to a lot of hand-to-hand non-combat and then personal relationships that chapter gets at it best however um, my personal favorite chapter is how to be the black employee and that was the easiest one to write it flew out of me in about, about two hours and then I, I edited it some I'm not saying it came out perfect but I literally just wrote down things that happened and I was like, oh, and this one, and then the dance scene. And it's just so ridiculous. I think it gets people right. laughing most potentially and thus loosening up any awkwardness around race relations as a conversation. Thank you. Yeah, that was dope. Does anyone have any questions based off of that, off of that question, possibly? Anyone? Wow, that's how good you were. You just shut down. <laughs> They're like, not only do I not have a follow up, I don't have any questions about life. <laughs> I know what I'm eating for breakfast tomorrow. Oh, I know how I'm feeding my kids next week. You are so good. Okay. Um, well, in in the, um, in the book, you also um, questioned, I think it was uh, Elon James White, about yes. uh, the title of his piece, uh, the title of, uh, you know, This Week in Blackness, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what it's called. Um, but did you get any criticism based on just the title of calling it How to Be Black or about just the, the look of the book or anything? Yes. Um, less than I expected. I did get criticism for the title. Not so much for the look in any distinct way from the title, but the title was a farce. It's the opposite, right? For those of you, I think you probably have all read the book, but that may be an assumption. You certainly are open-minded enough to pay $5 to watch a YouTube chat. So you're sympathetic uh, at minimum. And the goal was to just rile people up a little bit, mess with them, and have some comedic fun. Some people will take jokes very literally uh, because they insist on doing so because they don't enjoy their lives. And they want to make things hard for themselves. So they're like, oh, you think there's one way to be black? You can't tell me how to be black. It's so not that. 
uh, if you just glance at the blurb, uh, or even the sub, like the Onion and Jack and Joe Politics are mentioned, so you're like, okay, it's probably tongue-in-cheek. So the, most of the criticism has come from people who didn't have the time, if I'm being nice, or didn't bother, if I'm being a little more judgmental, to take one extra step and think about what might be one page past the title. Uh, and I can't like begrudge all people like that. Everybody's busy, so I get the knee-jerk reaction. But in terms of any substance mm-hmm. beyond that, not really. That's that's a misunderstanding. It's also kind of a filter. Like if you're not willing to grant that I can play with that, then we probably don't have too much else to talk about, and this just isn't for you. Uh, you should read a policy okay. paper or just cry alone and feel bad about things. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Anyone want to jump in, please? <laughs> okay. that, that includes the typing people who might just be watching this and aren't in video with us. Just throw it in the chat, click chat, right. the left, and I'm taking uh, a look at that uh, as well. Karen said it was a great question. It actually was, because when you wrote the book, yeah. when I first saw the book, I'm like, who's this dude and why is he trying to tell me how to be black? <laughs> That's the first thing I learned. <laughs> you know, especially in grad school, like, oh, I know how to be black. Which one do you want? <laughs> so that was, that's the first thing that intrigued most people about the book. And I think the sound clouds that you do and everything else that goes with, with it and the, you know, the updates just make it great. You know, I just, I'm in just to just enjoy the conversation. So so I have I have a follow-up question for you, which is, um, how did you get past that initial, like, who is this dude think he is telling me how to be black? I already know that. What what got you over that hurdle? I paid attention. You weren't <laughs> ignorant with it. Here's the thing. You know, it's like you meet people who are like, you must do this, you must do that, and you're in this sorority, you should be this way, you go to this school, you have this degree, you should be that way. But it's not like you're like, you have to be black, you have to speak this way, be this way at work. And you were just like, hey, dude, this is life. Okay, now, here are the things that go with it. You weren't obnoxious with it, you know what I mean? But you knew what you were talking about. Awesome. All right. I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I try to not be obnoxious. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, you know the ignorant, obnoxious, that drive people crazy? I do. I do. Uh, I'm just making one little change to uh, the video real quick. And let's see. All right, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Lauren, I'll I'll give the pass the mic back to you. Love it. Yeah, well, um, when you were saying about the knee-jerk reaction to looking at the title of the book, it yeah. reminded me a bit of, and this is a little bit off topic, but it reminded me a bit of the criticism about uh, Django Unchained. And mm-hmm. I was wondering if you saw the movie, and if you did, what did you think about it? Because I know that like Spike Lee was very, um, very uh, passionate about not seeing the movie, um, but he had all these things to say. And I wondered, what did you even think about that? And that's a weird sound in the background. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that was. Um, yes, I, uh, I did see the film. I have complicated feelings uh, about the movie. So a couple of things. One, uh, I saw it over my winter vacation in, uh, at BAM in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Academy of Music for those mm-hmm. remote. And it was a theater mostly of white people. I went in with two black friends, and we were like the raisin in the sea of milk uh, of the theater. And that created some awkwardness because there were things where the audience was laughing and I was like, you don't get to enjoy this yeah, too soon. Like, no, no, stop enjoying the film in that way. The yeah. other was there were some really hard parts of that movie to watch from just a graphic violence perspective. And I actually couldn't watch right. some of those scenes. There was like some very um, brutal violence with dogs and, and killing. That was bad. Um, right. I did also, however, like respect the injection of humor in some very awkward moments. And for those who haven't seen it, this isn't an overall spoiler, and the statute of limitations is expired. So, <laughs> with it. but there's a there's a great scene where uh, a bunch of clan raiders, you know, dudes with the white hoods on, are on their horses riding in to terrorize black folk, and they keep getting the eye holes shifted out of place. And they pull over, and 
one, the guys are just complaining, like, who, who made these sheets? Like, who? D-? And this guy's like, my wife made these sheets. She spent all day cutting these sheets, and if you're not going to appreciate that, then I'm not going to help you guys out anymore, and we'll just stay. And the guy's like, but it's not scary without the sheets. And one of the guys like, I can't see. Like, do you need to see? The horse knows where he's going anyway. Just enjoy the ride. And I thought that was uh, very sensitive and almost beautiful in a way that I didn't expect. I didn't see it coming. And so I was like, all right, Tarantino. Like, I have some issues with him. He does have a very liberal application uh, of the N-word. He's like a person who uses too much lotion, but it's not lotion. It's N-word. And I don't think he needs it, right? He doesn't get ashy, so I'm not sure why he's just so obsessed with it. But... Um, so yeah, those those oh, are like some that. of the ranges of my feelings about uh, Django Unchained. Cool, thank you. Of course. Sorry, thanks. I know this is a little random. <laughs> no, it's it a very. Um, can we back open? <laughs> can we open it back up? Does anybody have any questions so far? Let's see. And we have some new people. If you wanted to. What's uh, up, new people? Introduce them. Oh, yeah. them. We, um, we have. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to skip over to Sarah Vasquez. You're on. Uh, how are you? Where are you? And how did you find out about this? Go. Um, I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. I'm good. I'm from Austin, Texas. And um, I found out from Twitter. <laughs> nice. So you may have missed this amazing moment from earlier. <laughs> Nice. It doesn't fit with the <laughs> gamer headsets. <laughs> I would show you my cowboy boots, but I can't get my leg that high. I'm a, uh, we'll come back to that. So thank you, uh, thank you very much for for being here. Uh, what else we got in terms of interactive media engagement opportunities? Did you have any other uh, stuff, Lauren? Um, let me see, yes. So it's been a year since the book was published. Um, did any, has anything happened um, that has made you think, oh, I, sh I, wish, I wish I had waited to publish the book. I wish I could have added some, I could have talked about this in the book. Um, is there anything that you wish you could have, could yeah. cover? Yeah, there is, um. Post-publication. Sort of. The book, I didn't try, I didn't want the book to be tied too much to like mm -hmm. the year 2011 or the year 2012. So I do right. make a lot of hints at, especially on the presidential side, and I take a little swipe at Michelle Bachman um, and Herman Cain, and I make some predictions because I wrote it before I knew what the outcome would be, but I knew what I thought the outcome sh should be and would be, so I, I kind of footnoted that. So probably not, uh, though watching every day there's something that happens that's sort of related to the themes of the book that could be included. There was an incident that happened in my own life that I'd like to talk about when I do public talks about the book that I think hits the theme really strongly and isn't tied to a particular year. It's just sort of the mood of where we are. And I was sitting the weekend that I kind of wrapped the marketing plan for the book. This is My birthday is September 11th. This was the day before that. I had been all day in meetings with a really close group of friends, explicitly trying to figure out how do we make this book a bestseller? Like, what can we do? What kind of stunts? How do we target sales for the launch week? So we came out of a six-hour marathon, like, jam session with a bunch of folks who donated their time to help me um, try to actually get this book read and not just printed. And I went out to dinner, and then after that dinner, I'm spent emotionally, physically, and I'm sitting at the bar, this bar called Delicatessen in Nolita in Manhattan, and I just wanted to be left alone. I was done interacting with people. I was exhausted. And this white lady sat next to me, and she starts interrogating me about what I do and where I live and where I lived before and where I went to college. And she's not negative. She's a very positive person. She's actually too positive. She's very annoying. And I just was maintaining basic minimum cordiality with strangers. And I wanted her to stop, just stop talking. But uh, the thing that really woke me up, you know, in this line of questioning, she's like, oh, wow, you work at The Onion, you went to Harvard, you're like the whitest black guy I've ever met. And that was, uh, that was an interesting statement, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's it went down like that. Um, and I didn't, you know, was, that was a tough call for me to not strangle her uh, and not be like, yeah, I'm the last black guy you'll ever meet waiting for you saying <laughs> dumb things like that out, out, out of your face. Uh, think it if you if you can't control that, but you should know better than to say things out, out loud. Um, and so I ended up out. You know, we got into a little bit of a discussion where I tried to uh, explain that why that's not a compliment, and and I left uh, the bar because I was just tired. But that moment of you know, the themes of the book heavily touch on things like that. That was a precise moment, right. right on the maximum day of like immersion and trying to think about ways to get the book out there. And in some ways, that's the opener for the book. You know, it's it's like an incident like that, which is, and I present how to be black because clearly it, it's needed uh, in terms of identity management in the, in the world. No, definitely. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about other humans? Human beings on this chat thing. Uh, oh wait, I see somebody else new, and then um, we we'll get to Cambria in a moment. Who said they had a question? I didn't. Enter. Oh, good. So you can introduce yourself, location, how you found out about this, and then you get to your question. Hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I work at Together, so I was excited that you did this. Uh, Mike, I'm, I'm. I found out from Angelica, who said <laughs> thanks to me. Um, <laughs> That's what we call um, hyper local marketing. Yeah. yeah. Was there an argument over the title? Ah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, let's see. Not exactly. Um, okay. So, the original title as proposed was. How black are you? I didn't propose that. The publisher proposed it in our first meeting because that was a big segment of a talk I had given at a Web 2.0 conference about Twitter hashtags. And I'll even find that link for you and drop it in. It's, I think, still relevant. But the name of the talk is There's a Hash. Oh, look at the autocomplete. This is dope. That means people are actually mm -hmm. watching this. Um, so, yeah, I, I spoke in this talk about. What? That's not me. Never mind. <laughs> That's whack. All right, I'm like result number five. I take it back. Thought I had influence. <laughs> See, I'm pre-bragging. Don't ever pre-brag. You got to click first. Uh, okay, so I threw the link for that in the chat. Anyway, I was doing this talk about games you can play with hashtags, and I, uh, I think this, I think this is in the book, where I talked. You know, Elon, James White, and I were bouncing back and forth calling each other out for how black we were or were not. And we used the hashtag, how black are you? And that's what earned uh, the interest of Harper to have bring me in for a meeting to say, hey, you should write a book. And their original proposed notion was, how about how black are you? And I rejected that because I didn't want to have racial challenge as the main label that I entered the publishing world in. Uh, and it sort of undermined what ultimately became the core message of the book, but it just didn't quite feel right to me. So there was a guy in the room, Bob, I don't remember his last name, white dude, 50-something-year-old. He said, what about how black are you? And I said, yes, that's crazy. Let's do it. Because you can't actually write that book. That's insane. And so I'm, I'm going to write that book. Cause I'm insane. <laughs> and there was no argument uh, post that moment. There was a brief interlude period where I had a change of editors, and uh, it wasn't something that I'd wanted. One editor, she actually got laid off, and she was the one who brought me in. It was like very uh, understanding of what the concept was and very loyal. And I got a new editor who was less ideal and had different thoughts about what the book could be. And I went through a phase of trying to find a different title and entertaining new possibilities, but nothing worked uh, nearly as well as How to Be Black. So we just rocked that. I have a question. Uh, um, yes. So what topics didn't make it into the book? <laughs> oh, good, good, good question. question. You know what? Let me see if and I we're can We're all actually... adults, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have one answer that I know off the top of my head of just something that I actually started writing and didn't finish. But I'm going into my Evernote right now because I kept oh, in that 
a bunch of chapter notions, and I want to see what, um, looking back at that, what I cut. So I'm just going to be a little patient with me about, let me go back to the beginning of this. Uh, ideas. All right. Chinese. Oh, that was all posts. Oh, look, I found an alternate titles file. This is fun. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I toyed around with um, the Black Friend is White America's Cultural Swiss Army Knife. That's long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was, like, looking for pull quotes on the book to, like, be alternate titles. It was How to Be Black is the perfect title. I should have just stuck with that. Um, ebook plan. Yo, there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't do. Let's see. Essay, essay. Ah, all right. So here's I found it. Yo, yo, this is exciting. No one's ever asked this. This is some exclusive shit. <laughs> so I'm looking at my. Uh, I had this section called all the the how tos. I was going to do how to be a black consumer, and talk about how black people are marketed to uh, and advertised at, and all the classes of products that are like dumped on black people. It's like you can eat this horrible shit and have terrible financial services options. Um, and you like to be yelled at because you only understand ads through hip hop. Uh, so that I really wanted to do like mock ads and uh, scripts and just do this over the top, dripping satirical like guide to marketing to black people. Um, there was going to be a how to be black online, which I did a, a brief talk about at South by Southwest a few years ago, and that video is on YouTube. Uh, and it was a little more research based and actually factual. And just felt a little out of place because this wasn't that kind of book. Like there was research, but through interviews and personal memoir, not a bunch of reports. That's a different type uh, of book. So I let that go. Um, I did do How to Be Black President. I thought about doing How to Be um, a Black First Lady as a distinct <laughs> chapter and really do a parallel version of what the Obama chapter was for Michelle. And what you can expect as first lady issues you're allowed to talk about, how you're supposed to look, how you're not supposed to look, and just you can't get it right. right. In most cases, cases, the answer is you can't. Everybody hates you. Um, that's actually not true with Michelle. Most people love her. Uh, and I think if I had written that based on like the first year or six months of information about her, I might have been totally wrong because she ended up winning everybody over, except for the truly uh, heinous people. Uh, there was another chapter... Uh, I was going to do one on camping uh, and do like a whole memoir chapter on camping. I was thinking about doing how to be black abroad and what you can expect in terms of uh, impressions that people have of you, mostly based on media consumption about what black Americans are like. But also occasionally, this came out in the Jaquetta interview, how some people haven't been saturated by that and they assume your American identity before your black American identity. And she went, right. I think she said she went to Turkey. I might have the nation wrong, but this is something you can look up in the book. And people just assume she was American, so she must be like a doctor. And no one ever assumed she's a doctor when she just walking around New York uh, or anywhere <laughs> in America uh, as a black woman with natural hair. Uh, and then the one that I got closest to finishing, and this I really haven't talk too much about, but I'll go into some, some detail. I wanted to get at this Tyler Perry issue. And I was going to do a whole chapter called How to Write a Tyler Perry Movie. And I, this is how committed I was. I identified all the Tyler Perry movies that were in the world at the time, and then I watched them all. Uh, I watched oh, like 13 Tyler Perry movies in a week. It was a marathon. It was all I did when I woke up or when I got home. And I, I went to um, Kennedy Fried Chicken, and I ate fried chicken while I watched the Tyler Perry movies <laughs> just to really get myself in the zone. And, uh, and I took notes. I have a whole notes file. I have a little grid of, like, what the themes are. But I just didn't get – I didn't have enough time. And if I wanted to do that, I wanted to nail it. And I even thought about doing it as, like, an ebook extra or some bonus chapter for the electronic version after, maybe for the paperback, but I just, once the book was out, I was too busy running around to add a big pile of new content like that. So that's, if there's one chapter I regret not adding, or I thought at least could have been a lot more fun to add, it would have been that one. And, uh, yeah. Tyler oh. Perry. So. <laughs> That's a good question. Wait, oh, and just not, not too long. Movie you've seen. 
Uh, it's, this was it was a while ago. I let me look at Wikipedia right quick, and I can tell you. Um, <laughs> Tyler Perry wiki. He should have his own Wikipedia at this point. Tylerpedia. All right. Let's see his movie and TV. How do I just get to the? There we go. Oops, that's just the photo. Uh, bah. let's see television film. Oh, that's not a. There we go. All right, 2005. Yeah, Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Check. Medea's Family Reunion. Check. Daddy's Little <laughs> Girls. Why did I get married? Meet the Browns. The family that prays. Medea goes to jail. Uh, I can do bad all by myself. Why did I get married too? Uh, I definitely saw all those. I can't remember if I saw Medea's Big Happy Family. I got to see what the release date was on that. I may have, it was April 22nd, 2011. I may have gotten that in, but I don't know. I had to watch all these through um, online, you know, because it was like I was looking it back. So I did Amazon, a combination like Amazon and Netflix and iTunes. I've spent a lot of money on those movies. I spent like $100. <laughs> Tyler Perry's Empire is stronger. Oh, I had some, like, DVD <laughs> yeah, DVD too slow. I, I couldn't wait for things to be shipped to me. I, I'm a modern like human, so it would just frustrate me to. I didn't even have a DVD drive, I don't think, at the time, though I, I might have it. I think in the iMac, I didn't have a DVD drive. So, what I did discover, though, not to like hide what I might have said, I went in. I A lot of my own peers, especially folks in comedy or like black intellectual types, they just write all Tyler Perry, like, oh, he's destroying our people. He's got these dumbass messages. And I had refrained from public comment because I don't like to just mouth off ignorantly about things that I've not actually consumed. That's why I hate Twilight so much because I actually have read them and I know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm an informed <laughs> consumer and I have earned the right to shit all over that terrible film and literary franchise. Tyler Perry, I felt like, I don't Maybe it's great. Maybe there's something that I haven't seen. And I got part of the way there. I don't think it's great. But... There is a lot of interesting stuff in his movies, and he deals with topics that not everybody's comfortable dealing with. Mostly painful, sad, depressing, um, pathological things, and a lot of intra-community dysfunction. Uh, and so that's the the plus side. I think he goes there in a really dark and negative way, and that's part of his art. And like, he's got a right to do that. I think it's in some ways valuable that he does that. My issue really was one of quality. I thought he was just a bad writer. Uh, and repeti repetition. Yeah. You know, I saw, and especially when you watch all the movies back to back like that, you realize, and this, I think I did put this in the book, there's one movie. There's like old black people who don't like young black people who don't respect old black people. There's uh, a light-skinned dude who is in some relationship with a woman who sort of pseudo-abuses him, but he's not really on the up and up either. There's Jesus, who ultimately comes in and saves the day for everybody. And there's Medea with her gun, and she's just crazy. Uh, and then you have one of these, like, Jerry's moments, like, into South Park moments where it gets super preachy and, like, just, just taking a sledgehammer with subtext and hitting you in the face with it as if we're not smart enough to understand what the movie's actually about and what the themes are. And I just I felt, like, disrespected as an intelligent viewer. Like, you don't have to shake me and yell, this is the subtext! Like, I, I get it. <laughs> So I just thought he dealt way too heavy with the hand. Like, why is it art if you're just yelling at me what the message is? That you could just get a mic and yell things. The point of the movie is to use like the metaphor and characters and all this plot to get at things in a less direct way. And I was like, okay, you're assuming too much simplicity. At least in a part of me as an audience. So I I got annoyed by that. But it wasn't okay. a write off as I expected it. And I wasn't oh Tyler Perry's destroy. I don't think it's that that simple. Yes. Can I ask a question real quick? Okay, so um, I guess I have a confession and a question. So I like haven't read the book yet. I did <laughs> order it. Get out! <laughs> get out of the room! <laughs> <laughs> Who let her in? Wasn't there a so, reading comprehension admin? No, like, oh, what was it? It's the worst. Um, it's kind of like section. <laughs> kind of show up and hope that someone asks the right question. So um, <laughs> I'm I'm asking like. How, I don't know if you address this in the book at all, but is there a part of the book that talks about how to be black around other black people? Because, um, like, one of the challenges I faced when I got to college was, like, making new friends and, like, being around black people. But, like, how do you find common ground that's not just, like, hey, you're black and I'm black? And, and is there anything you address in the book about that? Or is that totally, like, off-subject? 
That is, I don't know why you would think I would talk about black people um, in, <laughs> in my book. I'm offended. I'm offended. <laughs> uh, it's so off topic. Let me, uh, I'm going to pass this slightly to anyone else who remembers because I get a little confused sometimes about exactly what's in the book versus what's in my life because so much of the book are things that I wrote down that happened in my life. So I have thoughts on the subject, but I don't know if I strongly dealt with that. Does anyone else remember the book dealing with things specifically like that or close to that? Please. I'm looking at the table of contents, and there isn't a chapter titled that. <laughs> <laughs> You have a reference to Negretta Stone. Yes, that's <laughs> right. A great app idea inspired by Chiquetta. <laughs> I just want to drop the mic and leave this hangout now. I feel like totally top Negretta Stone. So yeah, and, and the, the context for that Gaga was, you know, the region uh, heavily, especially around regional differences between Black people. Yeah. And Jaquetta in the interview was commenting that she's from a rural somewhat southern area, the Outer Banks of the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And she's like, I don't know how to talk to black people from Chicago. They have a whole other lingo and different yeah. references. And I feel like I need some kind of black translation app. And then I offered Negretta Stone as uh, the only possible title for, for this app. And then the other thoughts I had to your question was, I was trying to remember what happened to me at Harvard and what I wrote in the book about that. What I recall from that experience there's, there are different little subpopulations, especially in a black, in a college experience where black folk are the minority at that school. And I think at a black college, they exist, but it's a different dynamic. So within a larger liberal arts type environment, you've got people who are adjust, pre-adjusted, right? The pre-adjusted Negro who went to prep school or boarding school or some kind of college preparatory day school and is used to being around people who spent some money to get their kids educated and has been socialized and has been sort of trained to expect great things and know how to deal with all different kinds of white people, people with money, et cetera. And you've got the sort of the, uh, the polar opposite of that, which is like pretty much out the hood black person and like they've never been seen so many white people, like grass and all this stuff. Um, and there's an adjustment, you know, there's a transition. I went through that transition much sooner. I went through in seventh and eighth grade. So I was pre-socialized. And there is a, I know with, even within my own class, you, you could see this dynamic of the black freshman kid who was just like suspicious just of everything. Right? She's like, I don't trust these white people. I don't know if these <laughs> black people are really black. This is a different type of Negro that I'm not used to being around and always checking everybody. And so like maybe keeping more to themselves and more to the type of black person they're used to, questioning everybody, sort of hating on the system which has its value, but it's ultimately in that environment not necessarily productive um, versus like at the polar opposite extreme, like I don't even acknowledge that I'm black. Like I'm just a student. I'm just a student intellectually pursuing my dreams and my future. What black people? What white people? And they get criticized by different folks in the black community for hating, you know, being an Oreo and a sellout and not wanting to deal with their own people. So I do touch on some of that both in my chapter about the Sidwell experience and learning what an Oreo was to begin with. And that my first experience there, really within days, was a black kid who was my assigned elder buddy explaining to me, at first asking me if I knew what an Oreo was and then explaining it rhetorically and then pointing at a kid who hadn't yet <laughs> met and was like, that dude, that's an Oreo. Boom. <laughs> So that was, um, you know, that was my education in part. And then you also have this other dynamic, which was much stronger in college than in, in uh, middle or high school, which is international and mm -hmm. Caribbean-American, native-born African-American, actual African-born Africans in America, and some tension around, like, who's really black, quote-unquote, in this. The same stuff that the black establishment through at Obama was like, oh, he doesn't, he's not slave blood, so he's not really black. That's what all these people said right. in the very beginning. Even the ones who all have his back now were like, yeah, he's not really one of us, including Sharpton, who was like one of the quickest to lash out, be like, he's not really one of us, uh, until he saw I was winning, and he's like, he is my dude. I will go to the mat <laughs> for my black brother Obama. Uh, <laughs> Some, some extended thoughts on that. Thank you. That's a great okay. question. And I will take this break to introduce uh, Cambria. No warning. You're up. 
uh, Cambria Klein. <laughs> how, um, how are you? Where are you? How did you find out about this? I am good. I am in Brooklyn. I actually work with Together as well. <laughs> Um, it's actually funny because we were all deciding that we wanted to re start reading a lot of the books that we have, like from the authors that we represent or work with. And I chose yours as my first one to go with. And if it was the title or the great things I heard about it online, like it's so far, it's holding up. <laughs> awesome. I'm almost done with it. I'm actually. Um, Doing the Audible, which is hilarious because you are fantastic at it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that actually stuck out, which makes me laugh so hard, is the mortified bit. Oh, where you yes. your letters. I've never heard of something like that before, but I'm sure every person understands what it's like to see like an old letter you wrote when you were a kid, or like. There's so many random pieces of paper that you find as you move from place to place. You're just like, how did I ever think like that? Or yeah, where did those yeah. come from? <laughs> and just the way you read it was unbelievable. <laughs> it made me Thank laugh. you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm flattered uh, and appreciative <laughs> for all the nice things you just said. And uh, this is for anyone who hasn't experienced the audio, not to make you spend more money or go to the library one more time, but... That's the best version of the book. And I think the enhanced ebook comes in second because I threw a lot of video in it and um, interviews that I, I shot all the interviews in video. And so if you go to howtobeblack.me, you can see a bunch of that stuff. Or you just go to my YouTube channel and search for How to Be Black. It's YouTube. Actually, you know what? Let me make this a little easier for you um, and just drop the link in the, uh, what you call them, internet here. So these are the videos. How do you search mine? Oh, maybe I, you can't search a channel anymore. You sure you can? You got to be able to. No, Google doesn't let you search a channel. Well, that's just whack. Uh, you guys can figure it out. You're smart people. Search for how to be black <laughs> <laughs> using the Google Internet device and, uh, and and sort that out. But back to to your, to Cambria's point. The audio was so much fun to do because I started – Also, actually, I started in writing early on. I started as a performer as a little kid, but then writing was my first comedic expression through a comedy newsletter I started in college. Um, and then I got back into performing and got into stand-up around 01, 02, and have been doing it since then, but then back to blogging. So jumping back and forth, but I grew up in a very audio household. We used to take long road trips. We listened to books on tape all the time. We listened to comedy CDs, um, cassettes all the time, like Whoopi Goldberg and Bill Cosby and Eve Prairie Home Companion, uh, Garrison Keillor type stuff. So the audio version of a story is still the richest for me, and I've probably listened to thousands and thousands of hours uh, of audio books over the, since 1992 when I've started. I've been, yeah, shoot, 20 some years of audio listening. I should get an award. So anyway, doing the, the reading of the audio book, I thought of a couple things. One is everybody I interviewed, I had their audio pretty clean f with a separate mic when I interviewed all of them. So I just most of the time dropped their raw audio into the audio book rather than reading their parts because you know, it's just more fun to hear people in their home, hear the background noise, hear their intonation, their pauses, uh, their fear. And then with this essay... Uh, I, there's a show called Mortified, which uh, tours the country. It's in this whole storytelling thing, which has become quite popular over the past, say, decade. And their hook is bring uh, diary entries, letters, essays, homework assignments that you wrote as a teenager and read that stuff out loud in front of strangers today. And I got invited to do the Boston version of Mortified, and I started going through my files to see what could I find. And I found this paper the U.S. propaganda machine, which is me in eighth grade, just ranting against America and white people, and I was very pro-African with a K, <laughs> and I did a super dramatic reading of this in front of a live audience at a theater uh, in Boston, the Oberon Theater in Harvard Square, and it was a blast. So that audio from that performance is in the audio version of the book and in the enhanced version of the book as just a playable track you know, in that section. So... There's context for Cambria's comments. That was maybe the most fun I had actually putting the book together was just 
being able to do that live thing and then know that this is going to go in the audio version of the book that's hopefully going to freak some people out. Uh, I'd love to do one of those. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> so were you at all, was it just totally amusing or was, what else, did, what did you get from that part in particular? I'm so nosy about this. You kind of broke up, but I think what you said is what did I get from it, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And I, I was wondering about what <laughs> impression you leave, what were you thinking when you heard it? One of the main things that struck me is just how your surroundings as being a young person very much influence how you think. Mm. Whether you, I mean, that's all you're exposed to. And I mean, you had two very, like, fit, one side versus the other with your schooling and then, like, your your, was it weekend classes? Yeah. And it, so you kind of, I, I don't know how you would be able to make a decision back and forth, but obviously one took over for that paper. But just like for myself, like I didn't, I wasn't exposed to like two separate sides of education. So what I learned is what I learned. And it's not until I grew up that I was exposed to more things and more people. And it, just like listening to the way you were saying that and like probably the passion that you read it with is what you were believing when you were that age too. It's, it's crazy to think that some people never are able to grow out of a mindset of that age. Mm. And that, that's like the main thing that I was thinking as I was listening to it. It's just like if you had never been exposed past that, like how different of a person would you be? Bravo. All right. So you got to do the next one of these for me. This is great. I'll just between Lauren and uh, Cambria, I think we got this whole race thing covered. <laughs> I'm putting Lauren, I'm putting you back in. I think I'm controlling what people yeah. see. I don't know. Um, do you have any clo closing-ish things? Uh, anything you wanted to get to before we start to wrap up? We're not quite done, but we're getting close. Me? Um, yeah, I, I had I had another You're question. <laughs> I had another question. It's not so yeah. much going towards closing, um, but I was. Oh, nice. <laughs> if that's okay, if that's all right. She's like, it'll require another two hours, <laughs> but. Um, but I yeah, was go ahead. wondering, um, how has this book, since it's uh, since it was released, since it was published, how has it affected your relationship with your white friends, your white coworkers, white people in general? Um, well, I quit my job, so I have no white coworkers anymore, <laughs> and I fired all the white people in my life. So it's been great. It's been great. I feel free. I feel <laughs> no. The um, I actually here's here's what's happened for the people who I'm regularly and actively in touch with in a professional or personal environment. It hasn't changed the relationship in a really noticeable way, but I've gotten some interesting comments from people who have known me, people who I, especially people who I went to school with, in, in school, Sidwell School, like 7th through 12th grade, and most of that reaction has been positive, which is always nice, but also specifically, I didn't know that that's what it was like for you. And I think for them, it's a very special reading because they know me, and they, like everything that I'm describing, they saw from the outside and they didn't necessarily know what was going on inside, you know, sort of my brain and my heart area. And I put a lot of things out that I thought were, you know, obvious for me and a lot of my other black friends. Just we kind of sympathize without speaking about it all the time. But how foreign the experience was, or how different the perspective was. Same school, same time, same teacher, same classes. But I never dealt with that at all. Very interesting. And so I think for a lot of them, it was retroactively. Um, enlightening in some way, or at least revealing if enlightening is too strong a word. And they didn't know that this is how some things played out. Great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does anyone have any more questions before we about to close, about to wrap up? Okay. Well, um, in closing, um, is there anything that you would like to share? Anything that you want to get off your chest? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What could I possibly want to get <laughs> off my chest? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm very grateful that all of you showed up. 
and uh, and and paid money. I think that's really good. <laughs> and I just want to help. even the ones that make whiskey, especially the ones that make whiskey. <laughs> no, I have only done. Here's the history of these things. I, I did one when the paperback came out uh, during, and then Sandy hit like right as I was doing my event. Uh, so there was like some interesting competing tragic moment that was uh, contemporaneous with what I was trying to do to promote myself. So I was like, okay, then that's humbling. Um, and I did uh, a Skyped into a book club in Salt Lake City, Utah uh, a few weeks ago when I was on the road because I, I had no plans to go to Salt Lake City anytime soon and they made it kind of easy. This has been wonderful. Uh, so I just want to do some thanks to Together, uh, first Meredith, who's no longer there, but still loves the company and they love her, and Angelica for picking up and following through, making this possible. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for popping in. I emailed Lauren no, yesterday. No and I was like, hey, um, I don't respect <laughs> your schedule at all. So you want to do something <laughs> to make my life better? How about that? And she's like, no problem. No problem. Um, she, she's like, race is thicker than water, so let's just do that. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and to the rest of you who have tuned in and threw broken questions, uh, questions in, for those of you who read the book, everybody except Gaga, I want to thank all of you for reading the book. Uh, <laughs> really, really great, and I hope someday you'll respect me enough to uh, to finish the book that I put <laughs> my life into. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it uh, quits. Angelica, I guess I'm gonna if you're still listening. You want to throw me an IM or something in the chat room if there's any formal thing I need to say. Um, nope. Thank you. I could listen to you. Oh, good. So then um, the only other thing I will say to you guys is uh, for those of you who were the first nine, Angelica emailed you asking about your addresses to get How to Be Black mugs. Please get her that information back. Uh, if you somehow lost it, you can tweet at me at, at Baratunde, and I'll send you a mug. It's a How to Be Black coffee mug that looks, uh, this one's all bubble wrap. Whoa. And this one, this is amazing. This is the worst thing ever. Don't send that to anyone. So if anybody wants a broken, <laughs> this one's free. Uh, this is clearly a racist manufacturing process, but um, <laughs> the mug is really special, and uh, and most of them aren't like this. I shipped it poorly several times, which is why that one broke. Uh, so yeah, thanks to everybody. Uh, send in your mug data to folks, and uh, the, in the chat, if you haven't been checking it out, people are talking and sharing their own Twitter accounts. If you want to follow each other, clearly. You're all smarter than the average person because you did this. So you probably have other things of interest uh, in common. Maybe you'll date each other and make babies and a new society built on mutual trust, respect, whiskey, and bacon. I can only do that for all of you. And uh, this, is, this is me signing. All, I, actually, I can't sign off with that lower third. So I will just... <laughs> I will do one earnest thing and uh, just say that. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful night. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.